Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Michael Dickens. I am the curator and director of the, the new gallery at Austin P. State University. Um, tonight's event is brought to you by the new gallery, Austin P. State University's Department of Art and Design and SICA, which is the Center of Excellence for the Creative Arts. Uh, before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Yuchi, Shawnee, and Cherokee First Nations on which we are learning, organizing, exhibiting, and broadcasting today. I'd like to formally welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us for this evening's conversation with artist Laura Splan about her work and her exhibition, Entangled Entities, currently on display in the new gallery. Uh, this exhibition was made possible with support from Austin P. State University, SICA, and the Department of Art and Design. And I know we have many visitors tonight that are joining us from outside of Austin P. So thank you all uh, for joining us. And it's an honor to be able to share our renowned programming with the rest of the world. Uh, please follow the new gallery, SICA, and Department of Art and Design on social media outlets. And when I finish speaking, I'll just drop those in the chat for you uh, to stay informed about our upcoming events. So tonight, it's my honor to introduce our guest, Laura Splann. So Laura Splann works at the intersections of science, technology, and culture. She creates embodied interactions, tactile experiences, and sensory encounters that connect materialities of biotechnology to familiar domains of the everyday. Her conceptually based art practice combines a wide range of media, including experimental materials, digital media, and craft processes. Her biomedical themed artworks have been commissioned by the Centers for Disease Control Foundation and Davidson College. Her projects combining digital fabrication and textiles have been exhibited at the Museum of Art and Design and the Beale Center for Art and Technology and are represented in the collections of the, the Thoma Art Foundation, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and NYU Langone Art Collection. Reviews and articles including her work have appeared in the New York Times, Discover Magazine, Hyperallergic, American Craft, and Freeze. Splan has uh, received research funding from the Jerome Foundation and the residencies have been supported by the Knight Foundation, the Institute for Electronic Arts, Harvest Works, and the Pollock, uh, and the Pollock Krasner Foundation. She's currently a science uh, member of NEW uh, Inc. and the New Museum's Cultural Incubator. Span lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. So there are so many words that describe the work of Laura Splann intelligent, beautiful, cohesive, and blissfully poetic. Much like the curiosity that drives both science, scientists and artists to investigate our world, the simple beauty and crispness, crispness of Splann's work encouraged the viewer to discover the multi-layered conceptuality that is the pillar of entangled entities. This exhibition that we're gonna talk about tonight merges science and art and uh, with work that is heavily researched technologically driven, conceptually intelligent, and dare I say, aesthetically beautiful. So please give a warm welcome to Laura Splann. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen to get set up. Um, and then we can get started. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Michael, um, for that lovely introduction. And I'm thrilled to be included in the SICA's programming again since my first visit in 2015. And it's been a pleasure to reconnect with faculty this week while I was installing my exhibition at APSU. And I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to show my work in the beautiful spaces of the new gallery and really appreciate all the work you and your colleagues put into the coordination of the exhibition during these challenging times that um, have included not only a pandemic, but also a snowstorm. Um, tonight, I'll be presenting some of my interdisciplinary projects that explore entanglements of cultural and biological systems by connecting material artifacts of science to poetic subjectivities of the seemingly familiar and mundane. I often try to destabilize and reframe our relationship with the everyday and to even redefine what the everyday means. I created this lace SARS doily in response to the first SARS outbreak in 2003 and our increasing unease with the microbial world an evolving relationship with truth as it was mediated by different modes of production. 
This project was grounded in the intricacy of textiles and its associations with the familiarity and comforts of domesticity, while also being driven by a deep fascination with the seductive and sometimes alien representations of the biological world. I was playing with multiple layers of camouflage. Doilies themselves might serve to hide a scratch or stain on furniture, and the aesthetic conventions of lace serve as camouflage for the structure of an enveloped virus. Here, the DNA, RNA, protein spikes, and lipid envelopes become unassuming decorative motif, and the ubiquity of this often overzealously produced family heirloom might also be equated with the spread of contagious disease. Collective traumas born from disease, from epidemic, from pandemic are rematerialized in an heirloom artifact to be passed on from one generation to the next. I often try to compel an intimate engagement with detail, calling into question how things are made and what they're made of. And I use processes and tools that challenge notions of what is made by hand and what is made by machine, what is natural and what is constructed, and what is science and what is culture. And while simultaneously mirroring the conventions of radial doilies and superimposing the morphology of enveloped viruses onto traditional lace patterns, the doilies have inserted themselves like a virus into the collective consciousness that is Google image search when searching for both doilies and for virus structures. This project led me deeper into the layers of scientific representation, biomedical imaging, and the ways that bodies are translated and abstracted with technology. I'm especially interested in the history of inventions of scientific apparatus and the cultural circumstances in which they are conceived. The history of Rene Lenik's invention of the stethoscope in 1816 is fraught with varying accounts of its conception that cite gender relations as much as technical research in auscultation. One version of its invention tells a story of a female patient who by some accounts was too modest to have Lanik lay his head on her chest. By other accounts, it was he that was too modest. Lanik's solution to this socially awkward moment was to roll up a sheet of paper to create his first iteration of the stethoscope. The stethoscope itself embodies a social paradigm a prescribed comfortable distance between doctor and patient, male and female. In my stethoscope sculpture, I extended the length of the instrument to 25 feet, the longest distance at which one can still hear a heart beating at the other end. Its absurdity belies its continued, albeit diminished function and questions the technical standards on which an institutional device is based. My embodied object series used electromyography sensors to create data-driven artworks using this common medical diagnostic technique. Neuromuscular activities associated with experiences of wonder were performed as facial expressions and bodily movements such as smiling in delight, blinking in disbelief, and frowning in confusion. Each activity produced unique data captured by an EMG sensor that was translated into a curve using custom software, which I then used to create data-driven patterns and forms for 3D printed sculptures, including furrow on the left and blinking twice on the right, and frown on the left and smile on the right. The project examines the potential for objects to embody human experience and to rematerialize the intangible and to rematerialize our corporeal experience of wonder. I was playing at the edges of what is perceived as voluntary and involuntary movement, performed or felt emotion, fake or real data. The title of the series, Manifest, is a nuanced word that offers a variety of interpretations. 
As an adjective, it refers to the way the sculptures render obvious the unique neurophysiological phenomenon of each performed movement. As a verb, it refers to the emotional significance that the movements communicate, such as frustration or happiness. And as a noun, it objectifies the body as a vessel whose contents are to be cataloged in detail. I was inspired by Charles Darwin's spatial feedback hypothesis from 1872, in which he posits, even the simulation of an emotion tends to arouse it in our minds. His theory suggests that physiological changes caused by an emotion not only express that emotion, but also enhance it, that we can manifest feelings by performing their expression. I also created data-driven patterns for computerized jacquard weavings. With this tapestry titled Undo, I recorded muscle movement as I was unraveling another weaving. I often seek out these recursive and hybrid combinations of materials and processes with technology to challenge values of the hand in creative production and question notions of agency and chance in aesthetics. This fringe effect on the perimeter of the weavings was created by unraveling individual threads by hand along the machine woven edges. This act of unraveling was particularly evocative and murky territory. What does it mean to unravel the work of a machine? Is the work of a machine less valuable or precious than that of the hand? With this process, as with other studio projects that engage my fingers beyond the operation of a mouse, I often find myself thinking the word undo in my head when making a mistake, in a moment of absurd confusion of corporeal and technological experience, existence, and agency. Sometimes this word, which I seem to be trying to select from some imaginary cyborg drop-down menu, is even replaced by its keyboard shortcut, Command Z. Then there is the realization that I'm not working in a digital space furnished with history palettes or autosaves, but rather a meat space equipped only with my precarious, clumsy body. These paradoxical relationships between the body and technology can reveal something about the value we place on the labor of each. In the series of performance, performance sculptures entitled Material Expressions, EMG electrodes attached to my chest activate a motor that unravels a scarf I'm knitting. The title of this piece is taken from Ada Lovelace's texts on Charles Babbage's analytical engine, where she muses that the engine may be described as being the material expression of any indefinite function of any degree of generality and complexity. My task as performer, as body, is to remain calm, to slow down my heartbeat, to slow down the motor, to knit faster than the motor can unravel my knitting, or at least to maintain a state of equilibrium for an indefinite period of time. These sensor-driven projects are part of a larger investigation of the body as material, as interface, and as data. In 2018, I was invited to be a bio artist in residence at the Science Center in Philadelphia, where I was hosted by biotech company Integral Molecular, whose research includes antibody discovery. During my residency, I had the opportunity to shadow scientists and attend lab meetings where I took many copious and cryptic notes. And I also had the unique um, access, I had unique access to move around the lab, taking many photographs and videos of often unseen vignettes of biotechnology. I was particularly drawn to the lab machines with their quirky interfaces and their often absurd language that seems now more than ever so oblivious to the problems of the outside world of living. The images served as a document of the numerous biotechnological artifacts I observed in the lab, which I compiled into a book called Needle in a Haystack that includes the photos uh, as well as accompanying texts. 
And this spread in the book has a conversation with an AI chatbot that starts with me asking if they know anything about molecular biology, which is answered with, quote, there are a lot of them, real and fictional, point being, I am unique and yours. I also need to experiment with some of the software that the scientists were using for their research. This molecular visualization software works with models that are publicly available in online databases. So of course, the first thing I found myself doing was unraveling protein structures, such as this model of a ricin toxin bound to a camelid nanobody or structure 4Z9K in the protein databank. The camelid referred to was specifically an alpaca. Um, alpacas and llamas have unique antibody structures called nanobodies that are easier to work with in the laboratory. By using the specialized features of the software in unconventional ways, I created animations that are collaborative doodles of sorts between the software, my hand, and the molecular structures that are being disrupted. As the protein structures are manipulated, the software renders uncanny disturbances in the form of sometimes spastic and sometimes sublime movements. These videos are unedited screen recordings of performed interactions where my mouse is hidden. The labor of the user and the software is collapsed by the seemingly autonomous form. I showed this feature of sculpting the structures to scientists at the lab who actually began using it in their own research, allowing them to visualize structures in new ways. During this residency, I was also struck by the lab's use of non-human species for the production of antibodies. My conversations with the scientists led to receiving over 200 pounds of wool from laboratory llamas and alpacas who produce these nanobodies for human drugs, including vaccines and antiviral treatments. Since then, I've been hand washing, carding, and spinning their wool into yarn. My residency culminated in an exhibition at the Esther Klein Gallery, where I situated sculptures made with this hand spun yarn among other artworks that examined the hidden systems and invisible labor of biotechnology. This work questions notions of the presence and absence of bodies, evoking the mutability of categories that delineate their status. Lumen choreographs viewers' movements to sit on a rug made with the wool of these laboratory animals. In biology, the lumen is the interior part of a cell where a protein is folded and modified. Sitting on the rug engages viewers with unseen materialities and labor of both humans and non-humans as they touch the yarn and listen, listen to the accompanying soundscape that layers recordings made during my residency at the lab. Another component to this project and research is an interrogation of the language that is used to explain science. The doorway in the exhibition, or this doorway in the exhibition included appropriated text from the book, Molecular and Cell Biology for Dummies, that equates plasma membranes with international boundaries and casts proteins, uh, proteins as customs officers. The antagonistic implications of this metaphor were especially heightened by the zero tolerance immigration policies in 2018, for which we continue to experience the ramifications of. Viewers were instructed to move gently through a membrane of strands of llama wool. And the text reads, the plasma membrane is the barrier between the cell and its environment. You can think of the plasma membrane as an international boundary, like the border between two countries. The molecules that act like customs officers are proteins. Receptor proteins receive signals on the outside of the cell and relay the message to the inside of the cell. So here biology gets co-opted as some sort of scientific justification for the enforcement of arbitrary boundaries circumscribed by wars of the past and the artifacts of colonialism that endure in the present. These texts are often fraught with antagonistic metaphors that are grounded in narratives of trickery, 
Um, in this quote, after the virus is attached, it may trick the cell into bringing it inside. In competition, smaller molecules will be closer to the finish line. Surveillance, defensive proteins wander by to make sure everything is okay. And assimilation, chaperone proteins guide proteins to their proper locations within the cell. In order to read the text excerpt and enter the next gallery, visitors, visitors had to pass through the curtain of llama yarn. The gallery behind the curtain invited viewers to sit on a bale of hay to watch a molecular animation made with the model of the alpaca nanobody. An accompanying neon sign in the room functioned as an invitation, a command, and a resignation but also a mantra for moments of uncertainty and anticipation. While I was processing the llama wool in my studio, I would often find clumps of feces, which I began to collect for this networked laboratory mixer that is agitated by Twitter. The device activates when Twitter hashtags associated with the culturally contested status of science are tweeted. Here, the mere mention of hashtag global warming, or hashtag vaccination agitates tubes filled with laboratory animal feces. When taking office, the Trump administration advised how to improve the chances of receiving research funding with the suggestion to avoid phrases like vulnerable, diversity, entitlement, transgender, fetus, evidence-based, and science-based. The administration had also refused to sign statements that mentioned climate change. As visitors exited the exhibition, faint text on a wall invited viewers to come close to read, our distance allows our intimacy. The phrase refers to the complexities of existence in the biotechnological age where understanding of our own bodies and the bodies of others is increasingly mediated by technology. The sculpture blows a breeze in the viewer's face as they read the text. The speed of the networked fan intermittently adjusts based on the wind conditions near a farm in rural Pennsylvania. This farm is actually the 600 acre biological laboratory that gave me the wool from the 2018 shearing of their llamas. In January last year, they invited me for a three hour tour of their sprawling facilities to meet and photograph the llamas, as well as see the laboratory where they process their biological products, such as blood, organs, and tissue. Right after my visit to the farm, New York City soon went on pause with shelter in place policies for COVID-19. And I suddenly found myself researching this new, more deadly SARS virus that by mid-February had already caused twice as many deaths than the first had in total. And while sheltering in place, I collaborated with scientists Edgar Davidson and Ben Durans to create new molecular animations with models of the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. I often repurpose tools and techniques of science to engage with them both creatively and critically while searching for new possibilities. My new animations continue to explore the unraveling and distortion of the folded proteins of viruses and antibodies. This video called Denatured is a 12 minute screen recorded unraveling of a SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain in complex with a llama nanobody. And I've continued to collect more metaphors and language emerging out of the communication of science around the coronavirus, finding numerous sources for inspiration in the media, including this April New York Times article called Bad News Wrapped in Protein that's populated with a motley crew of the usual suspects like saboteurs, tricksters, magicians, and eventually the mysteries that lie at the end of the line with a repeating chain of adenine nucleotides in a series known in biology as a termination sequence. 
And I couldn't get this echoing melancholy of the repeated adenine nucleotides in the mRNA sequence out of my head. So I invited biotech scientists and workers to play the nucleotide sequence on guitar in recorded Zoom meetings. The recordings were made by simply prompting participants to play A on guitar 33 times, the number of adenine nucleotides in the SARS termination sequence. A live acoustic guitar performance of the sequence by integral molecular biochemist and co-founder Joseph Rucker became the backdrop for a textiles installation at BioBat Art Space, where I was invited to be an artist in residence while their galleries were closed for COVID. So I'm gonna play a video excerpt of this um, to uh, play the, um, the guitar for you and let you hear that. Uh, but it also includes uh, some installation views of work that I will talk about more after the excerpt. Mm -hmm. The slow and persistent plucking of notes is at once soothing and stressful, invisible yet present. And as you saw in the video, I began to expand my use of the wool and connect it with unique experiences and traumas of this pandemic moment. A layered and collaged video included recorded Zoom sessions with both friends and strangers around the world. During these sessions, we would unravel textiles while discussing the pandemic in wandering conversations that range from the personal to the political to the social. Part oral history, part conceptual craft, part performance art, the project attempts to unravel our unique and shared experiences of precarity, trauma, and resilience during the COVID-19 global health crisis. And participants are mailing me their unraveled threads from these sessions, which I'm then weaving into tapestries that incorporate the wool of the laboratory animals. And I often use these textiles, materialities, and gestures in both real and virtual spaces to examine our entanglement with the biological world and the cultural constructions by which we engage with it. Constructions of worlds that are so often mediated by technology. And I've become fascinated not only with the palette of colors available in the molecular visualization software, but also the names of the colors, especially since most viruses are smaller than the visible, than visible wavelengths and therefore have no color. So the mere act of adding color is another layer of translation and fabrication. The software's palette includes references to nature that are entangled with idyllic representations of the natural world, such as blue skies, green forests, ripe fruit, and romantic flowers. They present additional layers of abstraction built into the interfaces of the technologies we use to engage with and manipulate the natural world. They function to provide both simultaneous simplification and complication of form and understanding as it becomes increasingly difficult to define what is nature and what is natural. The animations in my unraveling series attribute uh, or attribute their titles to the software's palette. 
This animation is titled Lime, Limon, Forest, and its animated parts are SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins that are morphed molecular animations transitioning with their unraveled forms. And this is orange oxygen salmon. I projected the animations at the Brooklyn Army Terminal in the expansive galleries of Biobat Art Space, and they were accompanied by an immersive soundscape inspired by the termination sequence of the coronavirus. For this installation, I recorded a live performance by lab instrumentation engineer Frank Masaki, who is also a musician. Frank's electric guitar had an entrancing effect as he riffed on the termination sequence with an array of pedal effects and loops in what was nearly a 20 minute improvised performance. The undulating animations and otherworldly guitar sounds inspired by the materiality of the devastating coronavirus are at odds with the soothing experience that visitors have described as both meditative and womb-like. For my exhibition at the New Gallery, I created a new molecular animation with the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in complex with the llama nanobody that takes advantage of the large scale of the back wall of the gallery. The animation's colors include forest, sky blue, marine, teal, chromium, palladium, and mercury. This video's colors still echo the idyllic representations of the natural world while sitting in contrast to names of heavy metals found in computers such as mercury. I also expanded the installation of contested territories with one shaker for each of the seven words that were found too controversial to be included in science funding applications. Anyone can activate a different shaker in the gallery right now by simply tweeting controversial words such as hashtag science-based or hashtag evidence-based. I also played with the unique moving wall layout of the new gallery to integrate the walls themselves into a sort of expanded biotechnological apparatus that entangles science and culture, human and non-human. On the other side of the walls, viewers can see the networked technologies of the shakers and the fan laid bare. Flashing microcontroller lights, clicking electrical relays, and screen readouts of wind data function as an invitation to consider the unseen materialities of the biomedical landscape and the systems that connect them. The llama and alpaca wool rug is installed with a parabolic speaker that plays the soundscape layering sound recordings made in a biotech lab. Robotic movements of machines, gurgling dish drains, and human interactions come together to create a sonic tour entitled Chaperone. 
And curator Michael Dickens had the brilliant idea to install a rumble plate beneath the rug that vibrates with the bumps and bangs of the laboratory machines in the sound piece. The exhibition continues through March 26th and is accompanied by a fantastic essay by SciArt scholar and curator Hannah Rogers. And you can read the essay on my website, but I'll also paste the link to it in the chat. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about the work in the exhibition or other projects that I mentioned tonight. And thank you all so much for logging on. And again, thank you, Michael, for hosting my exhibition at the New Gallery. Um, I'll just copy these links in the chat um, while I stop sharing my screen. Or um, let's see. Thank you so um, much, Laura. Michael, should I? Yeah, yeah. Should I paste those in a QA or in the chat? Uh, you can go ahead and paste them in the chat. Okay. Um, so everyone has access to them. Um, yeah. yeah, we're going to take some questions, but if you would use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, instead of the chat. Um, and so I know some of y'all are probably typing, uh, typing away. Um, I do have a, a couple of questions. And I know we, we, briefly talked about this in the gallery, just because I was curious, you know, we have a lot of, um, I mean, our school is undergrads, right? I mean, we have very few, some graduate students, but most of our, I know all of our art students are undergrads, but you were not an undergrad art student, were you? I originally was a, a biological sciences major and I switched mm -hmm. to art. Yeah. You switched to art. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, um, I went into school at UC Irvine as a bio sci major and was taking art electives and then switched to art um, after realizing that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> but you stuck with it, right? I mean, you still had that passion. So you just merged the two and merged the two beautifully, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of, um, merged in different ways over the years. And I actually originally wanted to be a veterinarian. So um, this, what is actually kind of a more recent shift in my work um, that has been exploring intersections of art and science for quite some time is, has actually come back around to animals actually more recently. <laughs> All right. So one of the questions that's popped up in the Q and A, um, could you talk a bit more about what you said on our um, evolving relationship with truth? Yeah, I just missed the question. Let me look at it again. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's a few pieces that um, that I showed that relate to that in different ways. I mean, that's one thing that's sort of fascinating to me about working with the molecular visualization software is I find myself um, having to remind myself that these, these are not the actual viruses. <laughs> these are representations of the virus. These are basically graphical representations of the virus and which again are kind of, are typically too small to have color. So even just applying color to them is another layer of, of abstraction and, and untruth. Um, but um, with some of the other work um, with, the, um, I mean, even looking at the metaphors used to explain science, there's so much agency and personality applied to, um, to these biological forms and functions that isn't necessarily true. Um, and even sometimes the mechanics are a little wrong um, in, in, in kind of applying agency to um, to this, to these functions, but, um, and then also just thinking about uh, how, how phrases like science-based or evidence-based could be contested, how those could be contentious words in, um, in our culture, uh, pre and pre COVID and, and even certainly now. Um, right. Yeah, I know you're talking about the terms. We talked about this in the gallery about the, the title of the sound piece, Chaperone. 
Mm -hmm. right and how that is related right so could you talk a little bit about that like why yeah. chaperone and what a chaperone is <laughs> as far as your reference yeah yeah so um I was just doing when I was doing the residency in 2018 at the the molecular biology lab I was just using um different resources to research the the science of cellular biology and um I often had a very difficult time getting through these texts, um, not, not only because they were complicated concepts, but because I was so fascinated by the language that was used to describe um, these biological phenomena and, and the terms that were co-opted from other cultural contexts to explain the science. So there, there is a protein that's referred to as a chaperone protein, and its job is to um, to um, help other proteins maybe get inside of a cell. Um, so I was just really kind of struck by that, the poetry of that, and also the kind of absurdity of that, that, um, that for me, the image of a chaperone is somebody who, you know, might be like, um, enforcing proper decorum <laughs> in a social situation or, you know, carefully kind of um, showing somebody how something is done. Um, so, you know, there's a certain, it evokes both like care and surveillance at the same time um, or assimilation at the same time. So just this kind of confusion um, of the cultural and the scientific is, is endlessly fascinating to me, um, especially when it comes to, to language. Right. Um, before I ask another question, I'm going to, in the chat, I'm actually going to put a link to the 3D virtual walkthrough of oh, yeah. the gallery space. Um, uh, it's going to be re-released with uh, audio and, and, and more integration with that. But if you guys would like to take a look at that on a split screen and, uh, and walk around while you're in, you know, thinking of a question. Um, as an artist, your work is very collaborative. Mm. I mean, it's your research, but your research relies on a lot of other people um, and your use of the other people in your work, such as mm -hmm. uh, um, the guitarists and the scientists, you know, and it seems yeah. to have this great, bridge between these two disciplines um could you talk about just that experience of just relying on others to make your work sometimes yeah it's it's definitely changed um over the years and and it's actually a relatively new um part of my practice like i um i didn't really start uh collaborating in the way that i have been recently until i did that residency in 2018 at the lab and um there were just a lot of there was a lot of kind of serendipity that happened around the lab where you know i would get interested in something and then somebody would take the time to show me how to use you know use the software or and then i would kind of like run with that in a direction and um, and then come back with questions or, you know, that might spark conversations between me and the scientists. And, and then certainly the, um, the very unexpected donation of large amounts of llama and alpaca wool was um, an unexpected bridge between not only the lab that I was in residence at, but also two, two other labs that were, that are in rural Pennsylvania that, um, that have uh, vivariums and um, that have animals that produce biological products. And, but then when, um, when shelter in place happened for COVID, I started to think about collaboration in a different way. And I started to, and a lot of that was informed by Zoom. A lot of it was really just thinking about, um, like really considering the fact that a lot of my interaction with people was either going to be through email or through Zoom or through phone. And I was, I had actually not used Zoom before COVID. So I was really fascinated by it, um, especially having a lot of video in my background and just thinking about it as a video camera and as like mm -hmm. a potential video art making device. 
So um, the, the tool of Zoom became very uh, integrated into how I was thinking about collaboration. And so I was going back and forth between just having meetings with scientists on Zoom where we would talk about their research with SARS-CoV-2, or we would um, look at different, we would kind of sift through models to see what models might be appropriate for my animations. Um, but then uh, it didn't take very long for me to start thinking about other ways that I could um, collaborate with scientists in ways that were a little bit quirkier <laughs> through Zoom. Right. What, what's been, the, it seems like the scientists have been really eager to collaborate. Um, why do you think that is? Do you think it's just another way of someone else looking at their work and what they do? Or are they uh, any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, no, I absolutely think that's part of it. Um, the, um, I mean, part of my experience has been that uh, a lot of the collaboration I've done has been within the context of a residency. So um, the residency that I did at the Science Center in, um, in 2018 was actually initiated by the laboratory itself in collaboration with the Esther Klein Gallery in Philadelphia, which is an art and science gallery that's been showing sci art for over 40 years. Um, so the curator there, Angela, Angela McQuillan, collaborated with Ben Durans, the CEO and president of the biotech company Integral Molecular, to create this residency. So they were both very on board with, um, with having an artist in their lab and, and collaborating with an artist, with artists in different ways. And they still have the residency, they're still collaborating with artists. Um, so it's, so, it, you know, it's, it's a situation where there, there's, people are already like on board with collaboration. Right. Um, but, um, I've also, you know, I have been, you know, kind of seen some enthusiasm from other scientists that are, you know, kind of seeing that model, mm -hmm. kind of think that they want something like that in their own lab, which has been really nice. <laughs> right. Well, that kind of ties into one of the questions that, that popped up in the QA. So is uh, scientific language a barrier for you or, and then, I mean, I know you have some background in science, but how do you prepare for conversations with scientists? Like how, what's your approach to engaging with them in the, initially? Yeah, uh, just a lot of self-study. Um, yeah, just a lot of um, really fundamental, like basic texts. <laughs> and I mean, I really did start with like the molecular biology for dummies, like sort of as a joke, but also because it was actually very effective. <laughs> Um, I was and, seeing if it was still on your bookshelf behind you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I actually just have it on a um, on an ebook, I guess, or Kindle or something. <laughs> um, because I needed to like highlight and and look things up constantly. But uh, and yeah, I mean, I think just kind of an ongoing curiosity slash research process and. Um, I, I think being very comfortable with not always knowing what people are talking about. So I, you know, when I was doing the residency, I was attending these lab meetings that were like two hours long every Friday where the scientists were presenting their research to each other. And I didn't always know what they were talking about. Um, but there were plenty of other things to kind of latch on to um, or go back and research after the right. meeting. Right. Um, uh, another uh, Q&A question. So you have a way of uh, pushing beyond perceived limits of the artists in your work. Um, through your curiosity and collaborative efforts, you've gained access to things um, uh, not usually available to create art with. Is there something that you wish you were capable of accessing but have not figured out yet? <laughs> Lots of things. <laughs> um... Yeah, yeah, there are a few projects that uh, I've either started or haven't started yet that I'm very eager to start after COVID that involve um, access to a biological laboratory and certain kinds of equipment. Um, so I, I think I've always 
had a surplus of ideas. So I've gotten kind of good at um, figuring out when the right time Mm -hmm. for an idea is. And now is not the right time for me to be working in a lab. (laughs) So, um, so I had, you know, certain projects just get put on the back burner until, um, you know, all the stars align. Um, And so, yeah, I think that some of the projects, there's sort of several projects that are, um, that are like, I started a bacterial transformation project um, where I'm genetically manipulating bacteria to produce dyes and pigments for, to actually call, dye the yarn, the llama yarn. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a project I started at the beginning of last year in a bio art lab residency. Um, and I, I really want to return to that. Um, so it's, I've already kind of laid a lot of research groundwork for that, but I need to, I need lab access to do it. Um, there's also a lot of projects that are more complicated networked projects that involve, um, either, uh, just more time. Uh, in fact, one of the, one of the projects I'm working on with the animations is, um, creating data-driven animations with, um, with the molecular visualization software. So the molecular visualization software actually has a Python command line. So you can do Python programming in the software, um, to manipulate the forms, which I've been tinkering with, um, for a while now, (laughs) but, um, and I'm slowly, um, getting to where I want to go with it. Um, and yeah, so there, I kind of, I always have a lot of projects happening at the same time. What's, what is your favorite part of the process? Is there anything that you would do differently or take further? Hmm. Um, I, I mean, I, one of my favorite parts of the process is just conceiving of the ideas Mm -hmm. and thinking of things that, seem impossible or um, or thinking of a tool I want to use in a way that it's not supposed to be used. Mm-hmm. And then when I get it to work, that's, that's the best moment. That's my favorite moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so like even I wasn't really even sure if I could get these molecular animations to work. Yeah. And so it was quite a bit of experimentation and tool testing to get that to work. Um, I've done other projects where I've done computerized embroidery on very fragile remnant facial peel, like just things that you're not <laughs> supposed to do. <laughs> right. um, and when it works, it's very satisfying. Right. Well, a lot of your work, I know in the gallery and I saw, you know, firsthand when we we're installing it is um, uh, also the computer science aspect of it. So not just biological science, but getting the shakers to work, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So are you writing the, that code yourself to, to scrub Twitter looking for these hashtags? Do you do that yourself or? Yeah, I, I mean, I've been writing code for a really long time. Um I, I've been writing HTML and CSS code for websites for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that kind of dovetailed into JavaScript. And in 2015, when I wanted to, um, when I did the work that was the electromyography data-driven 3D printed sculptures and the computerized jacquard weaving patterns, I sat down and learned processing in order to be able to do that body of work. I didn't yet know how to, to write the code that I knew I needed to know how to write in order to make that work. So um, that work really um, was a springboard for, for integrating code much more into my process. But with the, um, with the laboratory shakers that are activated by Twitter and the fan that is connected to wind data, Um, those were projects I had started in some way, um, and then brought in, um, a creative technologist and artist named Frank Massara, um, to, uh, help me kind of 
finish them or um, figure out what kind of uh, technologies needed to be used exactly um, in order to execute the idea or get the shakers to behave the way I wanted them to behave. <laughs> right. Um, there's a couple other questions in the Q and A. Um, are there other animals you've worked with or would like to work with? I know any, you, this one, this one was specifically llama. <laughs> any animals? Um, actually, um, since you're asking, uh, <laughs> um, there's uh, I'm I'm very interested in primates, and there's actually a um, a couple of primate sanctuaries in Louisiana and Florida that house. Um, primarily chimpanzees that have been retired from not only the entertainment industry, but also from medical research and, um, and, in, uh, and also space research. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm really, you know, fascinated and struck by the stories of how so many different animals are used, um, in medical research and, um, and, and what are the different, uh, you know, kind of products and supply chains that are involved with, um, the, the biological materials or, um, research subjects that are being provided by these animals and, and kind of how those get situated in our culture. So, you know, a llama, um, llamas and alpacas are very charismatic animals. They're, they're pretty adorable. Um, you know, and, and I think that that's pretty widely recognized in, in our culture and many others, but, um, not every animal, uh, kind of has, is perceived that way. <laughs> um, you know, you might, you might think of a lab rat, for example. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that it's it's somewhat um, it, it's vast. I mean, the 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 laboratory that donated the llama and alpaca or the llama fiber um, has many many different kinds of animals on there. It's a six hundred acre farm, and it's filled with animals. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah. So if anyone visits the new gallery, you can come to the fan and feel the same breeze that the, the llamas in Western Pennsylvania are feeling. Um, so a, a couple of the questions are rolling in. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this is a good one. So what's your opinion? Um, cause you work in both. What's your opinion considering things that are handmade versus made by a machine? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I use a computer so much and I do so much work um, in imaging software um, and I use a mouse and I consider that work to be done by hand um, even though it's done on a computer and I realize that many people would uh, disagree with that. Um, so that's my opinion. I, I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't distinguish, uh, what I do as much as maybe my audience does, um, what I do on the computer versus what I do, what I do with a mouse versus what I do without a mouse. Right. Um, however, I also recognize my own experience, um, being unique of, of different materialities. So, um, you know, I, my grandmother made a lot of quilts and she hand stitched every stitch in every quilt. And there's a certain, you know, peculiar or special recognition of each and every stitch as having been made by her fingers. And, so there is like a, there is, I definitely recognize like an undeniable, um, you know, kind of quality that those stitches are imbued with. Um, but I'm not convinced that the same can't be said for 
a line that's drawn with a mouse on a computer or um, a protein that's disrupted (laughs) with a mouse on a computer. Well, kind of following up on that same question, uh, Lumen, the the wool rug. um, um, So you carded all the wool by hand. Yes. And you spun it. Sort of, sort of. Sort of. And did you spin it by hand? I mean, that's where it gets really murky. So <laughs> you, you can card by hand right. with hand carders, or you can use a carding machine, which is a machine you crank right. Which with your hand. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm actually not sure if that's hand carding because I don't know enough about uh, carding to, to know what people's opinion about that is. Um, <laughs> but um, I card with what's called a carding machine where I yeah. hand crank the, the wool through it. And then, and then I hand spin with an electronic <laughs> spinner. Um, I don't use a spinning wheel. I use an electric spinner that is actually uh, controlled by a microcontroller. Um, and um, I, I enjoy that because I'm not, uh, I'm not coordinated enough, I don't think, to use a <laughs> spinning wheel. And, um, and this, the, the electric spinner fits on my desktop. It's super tiny and it doesn't take up much space in my studio and it does the same thing that a spinning wheel does. Right, right. Um, but then, of course, I hand cut and hand latch hook the rug. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is where you were going with this. Um, so there's a couple questions in the chat, and, and we'll probably finish up on these. Um, so, um, how do you navigate some of the moral issues and questions raised in the scientific field in your work? Like, how do you address some of those? Yeah, I think that um, one of the things I'm certainly interested in doing is um, just kind of pulling back the curtain on this expanded system, which I think of as this kind of like expanded biotechnological apparatus that is involved in creating things like vaccines. Um, And, um, you know, when I made that, when I started making this work with the llama and alpaca fiber in uh, 2018, Nobody I talked to had heard of the use of llamas or alpacas for for drug production. And um, now, today, um, people send me links to videos that they find about the llama and alpaca use um, for production. Um, And I think that there's um, a little bit more awareness of of how different animals are being used. Um, So, you know, Primarily with my work, I'm interested in just sparking conversations and um, just kind of also just researching things that I find surprising myself. Um, I wasn't aware of how animals were used for antibody production before doing this work. Um, And I'm just looking back at the the question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it was about like the, the kind of navigating the moral issues. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it's, I mean, I, I'm going to be getting the vaccine when it comes out and is available to me. Um, and I, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that most people don't think twice about the morality of that um, or the morality of the use of animals for a lot of uh, medical research or um, biological product production. But uh, it is something that I'm interested in kind of like pushing at the edges of, I guess, in in some of the pieces. Yeah, that's a question that could spawn a whole nother webinar. Yeah. <laughs> Just on that topic alone, oh, that's yeah. a great question. Um, um, 
<laughs> this is a fun one. And I'm kind of curious about this myself. Uh, what results will you get from the llama feces after shaking? Because I know I'm going to be the one that has to clean that out and shake it back. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what results will you get? I mean, what, what's going to happen? Um, so it will just be kind of a diluted brown water, watery <laughs> solution. <laughs> Yeah, it is interesting. I was in there today uh, talking to a couple of people um, and they were shaking and it was interesting to see the hashtags that were being used more that the liquid was more um, solid color versus uh -huh. like the water with the pieces in it that, you know, that haven't been shaken oh, as yeah, much. That, so you can that's actually so interesting. See. Yeah. And um and uh yeah if it's anyone... a form of data visualization in and of itself <laughs> of how brown the water is depends on how many people use these hashtags um so the final question um we'll kind of wrap up on this is um what's been your favorite project that you've worked on hmm. Hmm. um there i i really do enjoy um, as much as my work is like so heavily invested in biology and biological forms and biological phenomena, I really do enjoy the opportunity to engage with these ideas through technology <laughs> and engaging with molecular structures through software or kind of thinking about ways to rematerialize um, something relating to biology through, um, through different data-driven uh, devices or forms uh, and, and like kind of animating machines um, in, in different ways. Um, there's something very magical about that for me still. Great. I can't see what, you, what you, you, you do next. I remember a couple of years ago when I did a studio visit in your studio in Brooklyn, I think you had just gotten the garbage bags, the 200 pounds of llama wool. And I was like, <laughs> I just asked you, well, what's the plan for that one? You're just like, I don't know yet. And I'm like, <laughs> well, let's do a show. And I'll, you got two years <laughs> to figure this out. So um, it's nice to see uh, your work evolve and, and to follow your, your process and your follow your career. And it was great uh, having you here for a few days and hanging out with you and getting the um, learn more about your work um and you and um thank you everyone for coming out um mm -hmm. i in the chat real quick i'm just going to post again our social media outlets um um actually you should follow laura as well so at laura splan uh mostly on instagram mm -hmm. um but yeah keep in touch uh with her as far as what she's doing next um Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Sika. Um, I do want to thank our Austin Peay's IT department for working with us this week and getting it, everything settled so everything is up and running. It's running beautifully. Um, be sure to uh, come by and visit the gallery, too. The gallery is open. Uh, our, our COVID hours is what I call them. Uh, Tuesday through Thursday, 10 to 3. If you have a group or a class that wants to come outside of those times, just shoot me an email and I can come open the gallery and turn everything on. And so you can see it and actually experience it in person. So please don't hesitate to ask. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Laura. Thank it's you, Michael. A pleasure. And we'll see everyone soon. <laughs> All right.